Okay, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to discuss this paper. Uh, I think this paper is part of a very, very important research agenda. As financial economists, we've done very little work trying to understand the interaction between policy decisions and financial markets and vice versa, and I think much more work is, in, is, is required in this area. And so I quite like this paper, and I think much more of this we would need. Uh, so we have work understanding, some work understanding how policy decisions affect asset prices, but kind of the focus here is that politicians do what politicians decide to do, and politicians decide to do different things depending on how they wake up in the morning. So their political agendas are constantly changing, they're reacting to how markets are behaving, how the economy is going, and so on and so forth. And even when they make a decision, both them and us have a hard time understanding what the impact of the decision is going to be in the markets for quite some time. So there's a lot of uncertainty related to this, and this uncertainty has real impacts as well. So there's work on showing that this affects asset prices, namely a um, previous paper by Lubos uh, and Pietro, work showing that this affects the behavior of firms, for example, a nice paper by my colleague Brandon Julio. And um, Lubos mentioned this recent, this very nice recent working paper by Baker, Bloom and Davies. So they construct this index of political uncertainty, and what they find is that it's gone up a lot in recent times, it accounts for more than 60% of total economic uncertainty since 9-11. And in the last couple of years, it actually amounts for about 80%, almost 80% of total economic uncertainty. So firms are out there sitting on piles of cash. Why don't they invest? Because they don't know what governments are going to do tomorrow. That's kind of a lot of, a lot of what's going on out here. So that's basically where this paper is coming in. So this paper is looking at different sources of uncertainty. Uncertainty about policies, and we're going to have two types of uncertainty there. So uncertainty about how they change, uncertainty about how they work. And it's going to look at the impact of this on risk premium, volatilities, and correlations. They're going to specifically model the government's decision to change a given policy, taking into account both economical and political motives. And the driving force here is essentially a Bayesian <coughs> setting. So there's going to be learning about both the likelihood of a policy change via learning about the effectiveness of that policy and learning about which candidate is going to replace that policy, if at all. So very quickly running for the setup, I have a continuum of investors with this evil CRA utility over terminal wealth. Uh, firms are fully equity financed and they pay only a terminal dividend since there's only utility over terminal wealth. And firm profitability follows this process where we have these two uh, stochastic shocks, idiosyncratic and the aggregate one, and two components in a drift, a constant one and the one determined by the policy, essentially. Now there's a date, tau, at which the government can choose to change this policy and therefore affect the drift of profitability. If it does so, it can pick a bunch of alternatives and alternatives. We don't know what each of these things is going to do. Each alternative is going to have some, we have some prior on what it might do. There are some variants associated with that prior, so we don't know exactly what this is going to do. We don't know what the current one does either. We're always learning if the policy is in place. So if we implement a new policy or for the existing one, we're just going to be learning depending on what happens to profitability. The usual stuff. Profitability is good this period, we think the policy is great. Profitability is bad this period, we update and we think the policy is worse. So this updating is what they call the impact shocks. We're learning about the impact of a given policy. And this is just the underlying capital shocks. We just have more productive capital in the economy. So just using the same terminology in the paper. What do governments do? Well, governments try to maximize social welfare for the most part. So they have utility function that's the same as the one of the agents. But they also have their own political priorities and concerns, the CN, so they prefer certain policies over others. We don't know exactly what their preferences are. I mean, we kind of know what Obama likes in general, what uh, Santorum likes in general, what Romney likes in general, but we don't know exactly. And we're always learning about what these guys, what these guys are more likely to implement. So we have some prior on what these guys might do, and over time, as they give speeches or as things happen in the economy, we update what these policies are likely to be. So that's, that's essentially the setup. And sorry, those are the political shocks, the first source of shocks in the model. So decision to implement a policy naturally occurs if the government thinks it's better on its own objective function. That is more likely to happen if we think the current policy sucks. That's more likely to happen if profitability has been low. So therefore, policy changes are more likely to happen in downturns. And this essentially gives the idea of this put option protection by the government. Things are going bad, the government is more likely to step in and give us a better policy. Now, if the policy change does occur, we have two effects on asset prices. 
we have future cash flows change on average, or typically that would lead to a positive return because typically this predicts higher future cash flows, not always. And that's one of the generalizations that are set up in this paper. In general, uncertainty is likely to be higher because it's a new policy and we've learned about the other one, but again, it might not be. Uncertainty might also be lower, but in general, that will generate a depressing effect on prices that generate a negative return. And what they show is that essentially policies with higher uncertainty are actually gonna generate lower return announcements for the same expected utility. So that's this picture that Lubos showed. So if things are going really well, we couldn't care less about the alternatives because we're gonna keep the current policy. If things are going badly, government is likely to step in, so we have this put option protection here. We're gonna to move to the new one, so we couldn't care less about the fact that the current one is sucking more and more. However, if the new alternative is likely to be a very risky policy, well, then we have this. Then we're discounting these future cash flows much more because there's a lot of uncertainty about this new policy and how it might affect the mean. So as the probability of this policy increases, stock prices depress a lot. As the probability is basically reached one, then that's gone and we're left with option protection again. So this again generates the result that, well, the return announcement isn't essentially how we should judge um, the, the, utility, the utility of this policy. And finally, the other effect that affects the return announcement is the likelihood of changing the policy. Things are going really well, the government decides to change the policy, that's a big surprise. Things are going really bad, they decide to keep the policy, that's a big surprise, and vice versa. Okay, so essentially the focus, the main body of this paper is about expected returns. And expected returns have these three components, these capital shocks, so that's just the standard volatility of dividends times risk aversion, usual stuff. And then we have the learning part, impact shocks, so we're learning about profitability, political shocks, we're learning about the alternatives. Capital shocks are just a constant, fundamental volatility times risk aversion. No matter the state of the economy, that's the, essentially the risk we have. Impact shocks, well, they, they follow essentially a hump-shaped function of the state of the economy. Why? Well, they inform us about two things. They inform us about the effectiveness of the current policy, and they inform us about the likelihood of us replacing that current policy. What I'm going to call pi star, since there was no notation for it in the paper, so I just invented my own. So, if we're in a very good state or in a very bad state, updating about the probability is essentially zero. In a very good state, policy is great. One period of bad draw is not going to affect our views on it, bad state, it sucks. One bad draw is not gonna affect that either. So we're essentially not learning about pi star, which means that most of the impact of this learning is actually in the average states, when we're revising our probability of keeping the current policy or not, essentially. Then in addition, if we're in a very bad state, even the learning about the impact of the current policy becomes almost irrelevant because we're gonna replace this thing. So it sucks even more, who cares, we're gonna get rid of it. Which gives rise to essentially this green shape here, that we have essentially the composition of the risk premium. So blue, capital, impact, all is the same. Green is the learning. Maximal in medium states when we're revising our likelihood of keeping the current policy or not. In good states, it's very important because we're gonna keep the current policy, so we'd like to know how it is. Here it's irrelevant, we're gonna replace this thing. Learning about it adds very little to the risk premium. Across different calibrations, the shapes of these curves and even the levels are fairly constant. Then we come to the political shocks. Political shocks are essentially irrelevant when the economy is doing well. Politicians speak, but most likely they're gonna keep the current policy because it's working, so we don't care that much. However, in bad states, most likely we're gonna replace this thing, so we really care about what's going to happen out there. So political uncertainty is effectively going to decrease the value of this put option. In bad states, we have this huge risk premium due to political uncertainty, essentially. So that's gonna counteract the put option effect that we discussed before. Dep now, depending on the calibrations, this can have very different shapes, actually. So we can have a completely counter-cyclical overall risk premium. Pro-cyclical can be hump-shaped and is in this picture. The level of this component can be high or low. Depends a lot on parameter values, as they show, such as the heterogeneity of the alternative policies and the precision of the political signals. So here it's not so clear what the prediction of the model is, essentially. Okay, last set of results I want to discuss on the model before going on to some of the comments. Uh, so. The f there's a final section before the empirical part where they compare the following different economies. They compare one economy, well, the alternative policies are very heterogeneous. They have very different volatilities. Let me call that the high heterogeneity economy. One where they have low heterogeneity, their volatilities are very similar, and one, a benchmark economy where we just can't change the policy period. So in that economy, we're stuck with this, that thing forever. 
risk premium volatility these correlations are always constant regardless regardless of the of the state of the economy it's speeding up a little bit so in good states the risk premium is essentially the same in all of these economies we're not going to change the policy so we don't care about the alternatives in bad states we do care about the alternatives and if they're very far apart there's a lot of heterogeneity there then this political uncertainty becomes very important so the risk premium is actually higher otherwise the risk premium is actually lower because the put option effect dominates which is essentially what we have um, here in this up graph Baseline economy, a lot of heterogeneity, very high risk premium, very little heterogeneity, very low risk premium. Now, these are shocks that affect all assets, so volatiles and correlations, those always go up in all of these economies, particularly the case in bad states of the world when these shocks matter the most. That's what you have here. Volatiles and correlations go up relative to this benchmark economy, particularly if the policies are heterogeneous, but either way. Combining these two, what happens to stock price depends on what dominates, political uncertainty versus put option effect. Okay, they have some, so I'll jump, given time, the part on the empirical prediction of the model. As Lubo said, there's you know, one index. Um, we have uh, trying to measure expected returns of small periods, and the index might not be capturing exactly which one of the effects in the model, so let me move on from that. So some of the comments. So the policy can only be changed once and for all. Uh, if this was a decision variable of the government, then naturally we'd think the government would step in much quicker to replace bad policies. Uh, this would mean the put option effect should be much larger. That's one thing we might imagine. And so the impact in bad states would also be higher. Uh, when I look at the paper and I look at the risk premium of different distances from tau, that's sort of what seems to be suggested. Um, in those results, it also seems that the importance of the political shocks actually also goes up. Uh, so it would seem suggested actually the risk premium coming from this sort of issues would actually be higher than what the current version of the model suggests. But of course, this is still a setup where we can only change the policy at time tau. So the decision that you take at time tau is very important because we're stuck with this thing. Whatever we decide, we're stuck with it forever. So I think it would be important to add a second policy change date here to actually understand a little bit of what's going to happen if we actually are allowed to kind of optimize a little bit, uh, a little bit on these changes. Then three, four, five, it's not going to matter much. But if we just add a second one, I think it would add a lot of seeing in which direction these effects, these effects are going to go. A few comments. So there's no intermediate consumption here. So we have the usual caveats in models without intermediate consumptions. Intermediate consumption. So one, the risk-free rate is constant. So we have to be careful about attributing all the changes to risk premium. We know the level of returns is changing, but we don't know whether the risk-free rate would change as well. So we have to be a little bit careful about that. Uh, equity market becomes somewhat of a sideshow. I mean, it's determined by the marginal utility of agents, but there's no feedback effect. So if a Martian was to come in and say stock prices are 10% lower than your marginal utility says, Agents would just say, sure, we don't care. We care about that terminal dividend. Stock market valuations are, don't, don't matter for that. One extension I would also like to see is that in the current setup, policy shocks are exogenous. Uh, that makes sense because then you have this clean analysis of the impact, but clearly these are more likely to be higher in bad economic conditions. Uh, we see now basically politicians running around like headless chickens, and that's no, uh, no coincidence. They move more in bad times. So it'd be nice to have a version of the model where we have a correlation, correlation for these things. Uh, and that's a very easy extension for you to do. I mean, that would be trivial. So bottom line, I think I managed to catch up with the time. Uh, this is, I think it's a very nice paper that gives a lot of closed form solutions to a lot of these, a lot of these effects, studying something that I think is quite important, the relationship between policy decisions, policy uncertainty, and asset prices. If we want to think about one of the concerns here is that some of these results might be hard to pin down exactly um, from a quantitative perspective. And that's because we actually don't have empirical counterparts for a lot of these things. So when I say it would be nice to have much more research in this area, I think it would be nice to have much more theoretical research, but also much more empirical research. So there's some research being done, but I think we clearly need much more, uh, much more in these areas. And that's it. Well.